presentation. Uh, we're going to start off with an introduction from the People's Forum, and then we'll get right into the presentation. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, my name's Ryan. Um, I'm making sure that people online can see me, too. Well, my head will be cut off, but that's okay. Um, welcome. Thank you for being here. We're extremely happy to have uh, healthcare workers for Palestine here tonight uh, to speak. The, you know, one of like the central um, crimes that Israel perpetrates, you know, part of apartheid, part of the genocide that, that Israel is practicing is the murder of healthcare workers, the attacks on hospitals. Um, this is like a, a, a war crime that underpins all of the other war crimes because it prevents um, you know, people who are being injured, people, people who are seeking shelter um, from finding it. So um, it's extremely important that we're here talking about this tonight. Um, I know that there are a few petitions going around, uh, around healthcare workers in Palestine um, that you all should sign. Uh, one is in the event description for this event. Um, and then also, I hope that everyone here already knows, but November 4th, there's a huge mobilization in D.C., a march in D.C. for Palestine. Um, I, my realistic estimate is now that there will be 100,000 people there. Um, and I hope that you all will be there too. Uh, there'll be a contingent of healthcare workers there as well. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to you and, and, and we can begin. Yeah, Thank sure. You. Welcome everyone, my name is Yazan. Uh, I'm presenting this on behalf of Healthcare Workers for Palestine, a uh, recently formed group in response to the crisis um, and what's been going on in Gaza uh, and Palestine overall. Um, this group is, uh, is committed to really discussing and sharing and highlighting and, you know, strengthening the voices of those that are suffering in Palestine as well as those that support them and hopefully will be an avenue for, you know, greater advocacy and activism in the healthcare space overall. So before we get into the presentation, just a couple intro slides about healthcare workers for Palestine. All right. So healthcare workers for Palestine is a collective of healthcare workers and students across the United States. The New York chapter is composed of a large and growing group of various healthcare professionals and students committed to the cause. And, sorry, there we go. Uh, the group initially formed after calls were made to congregate healthcare workers whose institutions were making, you know, uh, immediately releasing pro-Zionist statements while ignoring the Palestinian struggle and the genocide that was very quickly unfolding there. As the humanitarian crisis in Gaza escalated, more and more healthcare workers were facing discrimination, retaliation, and hostility in their workplaces, and the need came need to come together was needed. Uh, the group expanded from a handful of individuals into a larger collective, largely through word of mouth. Um, and something I'd like to say about this is that, you know, something that's essential in an environment where people are being silenced is building collective power um, and understanding what ground we stand on and making sure that it's solid and standing on it together. All right. The mission statement, Free Palestine, obviously, uh, first and foremost. <laughs> uh, we believe that health, as healthcare workers, um, we have a responsibility to stand in solidarity with the oppressed. Uh, we believe in accurately naming and denouncing the occupation of Palestine and calling it on its end. Uh, we believe that the Palestinian, that Palestinians live under a system of apartheid and are now experiencing a genocide. And we call for immediate ceasefire and end to the blockade of Gaza and to the killing of, for the pa killing of Palestinians to stop and an end to the occupation overall. So tomorrow, conveniently, uh, is our rally and vigil on November 3rd at 6 p.m. at City Hall. Um, 
this event is important because I think as healthcare workers, it's important. And for everyone, honestly, I, I, I keep saying healthcare workers, but really like everyone should come, you know, and it, but it's important for us to come together and take a stand um, on this issue and, and show that we have this collective power and, and show that, w you know, this is against who we are and against the, our oath that we took. And to say nothing would be, would be an abomination, honestly. So, you know, we, we've got a, we're there to mourn collectively and support one another, um, honoring healthcare workers uh, through a vigil that have been killed, killed since October 7th, and calling for an immediate ceasefire and end to genocide of Palestinians in the occupation. Um, to those that, you know, are, are joining as healthcare workers or in this, the field, we, we ask if, you, if you'd like to wear, you know, um, scrubs or a white coat just for, to show that we stand together as a strong body and a strong unit and uh, very important reminder, cover your logo if any logo exists, all right? With tape or whatever you'd like. And uh, feel free to bring anyone. Um, yeah, and your signs and, and banners and flags and candles as there'll be a visual portion, all right? And then this is, I mean, I'll add, I'll add this at the end again, but you know, you can use this capture to join, join our mission. Right. Okay. So, without further ado, I would like to begin the presentation. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, Dr. Hawash. I just I'm just going to start with this first slide, and Dr. Hawash is going to begin with a presentation here. Um, this graphic actually was made by, oh, I don't know where the title is. Oh, well, you, you're all here for a reason. Um, here are the names of all the healthcare workers in Gaza that have been killed sin since October 7th. As of now, uh, 124 healthcare workers were killed in this military onslaught. And um, this was made by a group of dedicated medical students and one of our organizing committee members. And you have the... The two uh, flowers are symbols of uh, the Palestinian resistance. And, you know, tomorrow we will be reading out all of their names. And, yeah. So I will begin with Dr. Hawash. part of the Health for Palestine team. And uh, if you can help me by going to the slide that has the pictures of the health workers, I, th I think it's slide seven. Yes. Um, please, the, with the pictures. Seven or eight. Ah. Yeah, just the one before. That's uh, that's just the. Uh, I don't see the slides for some reason. Okay. I only see myself. One moment. Mm -hmm. Can you see the slides now? Ah, uh, yeah, we, we put, Rasmi Arafat, okay, that's slide 58, Ryan, oh. can you control from there, Ryan, or? And Ryan, so the other presenters in the waiting room of the Zoom, you could let him in, thank you. So uh, Rasmi uh, Arafat was one of our community health workers in um, the West Bank in Nablus. Uh, I worked closely with him and uh, a few days ago I heard that he was shot by a sniper uh, with a deadly shot and he passed. 
Um, he is one of many health workers that have been um, killed by uh, Israel during its very long oppressive occupation. Um, I worked with the community health workers uh, in Palestine uh, with the plan to take care of children who have special needs. Uh, the community health workers have always been in, uh, very instrumental in delivering health care for um, those families in the refugee camps who did not have resources. And um, unfortunately, over the past uh, few weeks, even in the West Bank, things have been extremely difficult. We are not able to do a lot of the work that we used to do. I was supposed to be in, in Nablus actually next week. I'm not able to go there, um, you know, because of this genocide that's happening. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to say Allah Yirhamu Rasmi, he was a hero for his camp and he did so much. And then I, we can move to um, the first slide that you have on the deck. So we're just, uh, we just want to take a moment to uh, amplify the sound for those on the live stream. I just got note that it is not very audible yet, and then we can move to the first slide. What is not audible? Um, th those on the live stream, they can't, they can't really hear so far. Could you speak again, Dr. Hawash? Yes, yeah. So I was uh, thinking that we can go to the beginning of the deck. Sure. I'm just going to do a test. Okay, they can hear they can hear me, they can't hear those on Zoom. Oh. That's okay. I don't know why. Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. Right. We'll see. Could you speak one more time, Dr. Hawash? Yes, uh, it is Hawash. Hawash, sorry. My, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, I can speak. Uh, I was just talking about Health for Palestine and Rasmi Arafat, Allah Yirhamu, who was uh, our Shaheed in Balata camp, one of many health workers. Okay, yeah. It's better now. You can. Do you mind repeating the story for everyone on the live stream, Dr. Hawash? Yes. Um, okay. Uh, I was... Uh, Introducing myself, my name is Karama Hawash. I'm from uh, Nablus, Palestine. Uh, I'm a physician, uh, I'm a neurologist at Boston Children's Hospital. I also work as a volunteer for Health for Palestine in the refugee camps. The mission is to provide health equity for Palestinians in the refugee camps. And um, a few days, I learned that my friend and my colleague Rasmi Arafat was shot dead by a sniper in his camp in Balata. And I just wanted to say, Allah Yirhamu, please re-iqra'u al-Fatiha ala ruhu. And uh, I hope this killing would end and we will not suffer anymore. This injustice that has been endless and it keeps getting worse. Yeah. And for those on the live stream who didn't hear, Dr. Hawash works to train community health workers to, um, to directly assist families and children with special needs. And just a few days ago, he was mercilessly murdered by an Israeli sniper. And hopefully this group and all of us here 
will continue to honor his name and his mission. And um, with that, we're going to go to the beginning of the presentation. Sorry for the delay. Ryan, do you mind moving us to slide number one? Thank you. All right. We'll just go on to the next one. All right. Take it away, Dr. Hawash. Can you see the slides? Yes. Okay. How's it? Thank you so much. Just one second. So I, today we will talk about uh, Gaza, and we will talk about the health crisis in Gaza. Uh, as uh, health workers, uh, this affects us, and we should all stand up against it. Our colleagues are being killed, and our people, uh, innocent civilians, and especially children, are getting killed. Every time we update these slides, the numbers go up. So by now, the number of Palestinians that have been dead must be significantly above 9,051. Many pe people are under the rubbles, and there is no way to get them out with the situation in Gaza with no fuel, no electricity, and no water. Even the relief efforts are extremely limited, which will make the number of civilians killed much, much bigger than any estimate right now. So far, uh, over 3,700 children have been killed, and complete families, almost 1,000 families have been wiped completely. I personally know three doctors who lost 20 to 40 to 50 family members uh, over the last three weeks. This has been an incredible, incredible disaster and tragedy that is unfolding in front of our eyes. And it's very difficult uh, to be in, uh, in a system that supports this genocide. Uh, more than 1.4 million have been displaced from their homes, which is an essential part of uh, displacement genocide. Um, many people have been injured without uh, any chance of recovery, over 30,000 people. 124 health workers have been killed. 15 hospitals out of 35 hospitals are out of service, and some hospitals have been actually bombarded. And uh, in the West Bank, which has been extremely dangerous for the past two years, things have gotten significantly worse. Since uh, the start of the assault in Gaza, more than 100 people have been killed. That's, it's, it pales compared to Gaza. But the fact that we don't even talk about the people who are killed in the West Bank speaks volumes. Meanwhile, a lot of the civilians are arrested by Israel in the occupied, uh, in occupied West Bank and even in the 48 areas. There has been a lot of harassment for the Palestinian Israelis. They are uh, intimidated and they are uh, also incarcerated. Uh, the number of people missing is an underestimate, as I said. This is uh, the graph right there shows uh, what it is uh, when you are trying to treat trauma and you really have no access to uh, health care. You also have your am the ambulances are being attacked, the hospitals are closing. Um, if anyone of you imagines their city or their town bombarded um, constantly for three weeks, the schools are demolished, the hospitals are demolished. There is no school. None of the children in Gaza goes to school right now. It has been canceled. It has been canceled. I, I, I cannot see how this will uh, even start again. Uh, we will be uh, seeing uh, the ramification from this um, situation for years to come. 
we can go to the next one. Then. Yep. Uh, we also have seen a very crowded um, refugee camp completely uh, bombarded with civilians in it. In Jabalia camp, uh, there are um, 116,000 Palestinian refugees live in that camp. It's one of the very, the largest um, refugee camps in Gaza. And it was completely destroyed while civilians were in it. Um, obviously, the uh, UN uh, spokesman is appalled. Uh, and um, because this is appalling and the only thing is that it is appalling that no one is putting a stop to it that is what's more appalling than uh, the numbers that we're seeing that's right next slide uh, we have been seeing uh, videos from hospitals being bombarded and uh, the hospitals right now are maybe a little safer than the rest of uh, Gaza because maybe they will not bombarded. But the reality is that the hospitals are bombarded and the blame is sometimes on the Palestinians even though usually the story becomes clear and uh, the blame is quickly shifted to uh, the bombardments from the Israeli planes uh, or from you know the miss the Israeli missiles um, this uh, particular uh, uh, hospital al Quds hospital has been damaged before in operation cast lead in 2008 this hospital uh, is uh, housing 500 people in intensive care units, which is an amazing number. If you're in the healthcare, you can imagine what it's like to have 500 patients in the ICU. It's a, it's a really a, a big disaster. And these people are not able to move uh, from these hospitals and they are constantly told to evacuate and go elsewhere. Um, so the situation is very, very, very difficult. And um, Ryan, do you mind playing just... So I've included some media. Unfortunately, it can't be played in the slide, but I just wanted to echo what Dr. Hawash is saying to really imagine it, especially for those of us that have work inside hospitals on a daily basis. Imagine having 14,000, 15,000 people taking shelter, nowhere to, no room, you're feeling at your most vulnerable when you're injured and you're completely around everyone who's also going through some, in, you know, undeniable trauma and loss and the idea of 500 people in an intensive care that require respirators and machines when fuel is low, every single day people are not sure they're going to see the next one. Um, we could just move on, honestly, without the videos, just because we're running a little bit late. Is it is it available? All right, we could play like a quick, just for those that haven't seen it, this is inside Al Ahli Hospital um, when they were bombing its surroundings. So not only are people living in there under extreme duress, they're also being bombed and threatened to leave. And where do they go? You can play it. <laughs> Ryan, can you play the next one too? Just, I really wanted to, because we don't have too much time, um, just to get a sense of how crowded this hospital really is. This is inside Al Quds Hospital. People are being treated in hallways, sleeping in the hallways, entire families, all right? We can move on. Thank you. All right. Okay. Al Shifa Hospital is uh, another, uh, it's a very large hospital. 
that has been in the news constantly. Um, the doctors are uh, and the patients and uh, the health workers are told uh, to evacuate. Uh, this hospital is housing uh, 40,000 displaced people. It is housing uh, many critically ill patients. If they, if they evacuate, they will die. Uh, Dr. Ghassan Abu Sitte, who uh, is becoming uh, you know, a household name, is um, a surgeon and he, has, he flew there once, uh, once he w arrived in Gaza to help with this uh, massacre situation. Um, he's a, he lives in the UK and he works in the UK as a surgeon. He has been tweeting recently, he hasn't been tweeting as much because the internet has been uh, not working. And if you follow Dr. Absitta, you'll realize that the situation is completely unsustainable. There is really no other, no nothing like what doctors are going through uh, in, uh, in Gaza. And not just doctors, nurses, EMTs, uh, patients. Uh, this is a health uh, healthcare system that is completely under attack. Um, if uh, there is no water, there is not enough water. He, Dr. Abu Sitte was using vinegar to um, to sterilize wounds, which is, you know, it, it's. Uh, of, he will run out of vinegar and it does not work well. Um, people uh, are getting surgery without anesthesia. This is uh, an unprecedented um, medical disaster. Next, please. Another hospital is Al Ahli Hospital, and uh, he uh, Al Ahli Hospital was attacked on, on October seventh, and five hundred people was uh, were killed. Al Ahli Hospital sheltered thousands of people, and um, were the, a lot of the families and the children sold Al Ahli Hospital, thinking that this is this will be a place for them to just feel safe amongst the craziness, but even that hospital was bombarded. The only cancer center in Gaza was attacked on the 30th of October. The only psychiatric hospital in Gaza was bombed on, on October 13th. Um, the fuel is running out and these hospitals will stop uh, operating uh, once they run out of fuel and um, there is no ceasefire. There is not even humanitarian pause, like they call it, and uh, it's been, uh, it's just, you, you can imagine. Next, please. These are some of the doctors uh, and the health uh, care workers that we have lost. These are their names. They are lost, but they are not forgotten. And I wanted to highlight as well Dr. Talat Jehan Khan, who is a pediatrician in Texas, who was the victim of a hate crime uh, because of, and we're not, we don't have enough time to get into it, but really there's a whole, a lot we can say about the rhetoric and Islamophobia that is fueling this violence on the news. And, and that does seep into the conscious of the people here. And we already have seen the victim of a hate crime, uh, six year, six year old Wadia in Chicago. And Dr. Khan, a pediatrician, uh, was a victim of that. Who she was murdered in her own uh, around her own apartment building. And as uh, Dr. Hawash said, these names are just some of the names of of those that we've lost. Um, the uh, supplies are running low for everything, and it's a matter of time when there is nothing available. And with the bombardment, it's just, you know, there is, it's, it's the only possibility is that for more people to die. Next, please. So uh, these are just numbers that, you know, the same story is repeated in every, in every slide. We see a health system that is completely decimated that is becoming completely non-functional. More than almost 200 attacks on healthcare um, facilities in 
the occupied territories with 60 attacks impacting health facilities. That is in the West Bank, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, before this whole thing started uh, in uh, October, the hospitals in Gaza uh, were uh, only at 40% uh, in terms of uh, supplies. So what we're seeing is an, an attack on a besieged and deficient health system to start with. Next, please. Uh, I... Yes. Just, you know, this is a very, uh, very difficult picture to see. This is... Uh, uh, a lot of the doctors who are uh, working in the hospital and they could ha they can hardly leave the hospitals uh, because uh, there are so many patients to take care of are in the hospitals. Sometimes they receive their own family as injured or as dead. And while they're working, they also hear of their families uh, being killed. Uh, unfortunately, there is uh, no... Um, uh, aid uh, that can arrive uh, to North Gaza and uh, the numbers of those buried under the rubbles keep uh, increasing and the numbers of the ambulances available to save people who are injured keeps decreasing because there's there are no fuels and uh, the doctors if they are not killed by the bombardments their families are killed and they still work under these conditions hmm. and you know also, uh, one thing that we uh have been hearing um re uh, just you know over the past two days is that some aid arrived but the aid that arrived does not have the medications uh, that are needed and does not have the supplies that are needed so this is uh inefficient and uh, not helpful aid which adds uh, salt to injury to you know it's just a very very insulting situation yeah and as many doctors in Gaza have described they say that this aid is a drop in an ocean uh, a couple a hundred trucks firstly uh, without the necessary equipment and supplies and then not only that the north and the south are now being separated and many 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 people are sheltering in the north threat uh, under threat of bombing and require these supplies and there's no way to transport them considering even the infrastructure that's destroyed and the fuel crisis people cannot move this across um and thank you so much dr hawash for joining us she's going to discuss health for palestine towards the end uh of our presentation, the Community Health Worker Training Program. And I just wanted to introduce uh, Dr. Suheb Shawarib. He's representing the Social Medicine Consortium Campaign Against Racism. His work in the Atlanta Centers of Harm Reduction and bu System Building in the service of largely unsheltered and uh, incarcerated populations. He's also has some experience working in the West Bank. So thank you for joining us, Suheb. Absolutely. Thank you all for having me. Um, and uh, as Dr. Hawesh so eloquently put it earlier, the situation is emergent to say the least, I think. Um, as a healthcare worker with experience on the ground in Palestine and in refugee camps in the Middle East, but also an experience in um, largely underserved communities here um, in the U.S., we're talking under bridges and highways, um, treating unsheltered folks, I've seen some of the most destitute conditions that folks can experience um, and receive care in. And I have to say the situation in Gaza now is an all time high for humanity or an all time low, let's say in terms of the destruction. Um, and as someone who's uh, as an emergency medicine uh, physician and someone who's dedicating my life to emergency medicine, um, it is uh, staggering to see the um, the sheer volume of destruction and to try to imagine myself in the place of those healthcare workers who are having to answer to this moment. Um, so I wanted to offer a little bit about what that landscape of healthcare looked like in um, the Palestinian territories prior to the events of October 7th. Um, and as you'll see, they were already a public health crisis. Um, uh, 
More recently, in more recent times, uh, excuse me, over the past few days, folks are being uh, treated in tents. They're being treated, as you saw, on the floors of hospitals. Um, uh, uh, surgeries without anesthesia are just starting to scratch the surface of the 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 impact of genocide outside of just the direct bombing. Um, and so uh, part of what we'll discuss also is the permit system, which is the direct and legalized way that medical apartheid exists in the Palestinian territories. Mm -hmm. And as we'll mention, there were no medical permits issued to anyone in Gaza or West Bank since the October, October 7th events. Um, and that means a death sentence to those who are seeking life-saving therapy, including cancer treatments, um, and as we just heard, um, the only remaining cancer hospital in Gaza was just bombed, um, which is a death sentence for those patients. I did want to just offer an additional point. My older sister, an Arab woman um, of Palestinian heritage herself, died of inflammatory breast cancer. Um, and so to see the lines of cancer patients um, uh, standing in front of their decimated cancer center, knowing that this is surely a death sentence, um, shuffling along, trying to help each other um, amongst the rubble, um, felt like my sister's death tenfold. Um, and so I'm, you know, to to speak in this moment is a, our duty. Um, and thank you all for having me. We'll get the next slide. Um, so a little bit about the hospitals that exist. There's a lot of small hospitals um, in Gaza, a lot of which were already operating under severe restrictions. Specialty care a lot of times had to be referred out of Gaza. And so a lot of these hospitals already had limited capacity to treat their occupants. Um, when we factor in the when we factor in the idea that folks are going to have to travel or leave Gaza in order to get treatment, that means they're now in the system. That means they're going to have to apply for a permit. They're going to have to wait through the grueling bureaucracy. And we'll talk about in a sec how that bureaucracy is actually a legalized apartheid. Um, part and part settler colonialism indirectly impacts the care of Palestinians and Arabs when compared to Isra Israelis or Jewish Israelis. Um, and so um, the statistics are staggering. Um, uh, but uh, one more point I wanted to just mention on this slide. Um, the images, the videos you all have seen coming out of Gaza have been uh, have been very hard to watch. The suffering, the immense pain that you're feeling um, along with the people of the world in Gaza um, imagine balancing all of that trauma with 20 psychiatrists for a population of more than 2 million people. I want all the healthcare workers and folks who are familiar with the healthcare world here to try to imagine how difficult it is for you to get follow up and how difficult it is for you to get seen in clinic. And then imagine what it's going to be like when there's only 20 psychiatrists for 2 million people who are experiencing um, uh, unprecedented amounts of trauma. Um, let's keep going. Um, let's talk about some of the barriers that exist to care. Outside of just shortages of medical supplies, equipment, lack of the ability to perform intensive care and pre-hospital care in the field, um, I wanted to just bring up some of the studies that have been doing the work long before October 7th to highlight those barriers to care. Um, so outside of the fact that about a third of the hospitals and two thirds of the primary care centers in Gaza have been shut down due to attacks, and the shortages, supply, uh, shortages on supplies, including food, internet, communications, medicines, et cetera. Um, I wanted to highlight a study um, that uh, this was published in the, uh, um, it, this was in the Journal of Global Health, um, or excuse me, this is actually a qualitative study in the Journal for Public Health. Um, and this uh, study investigated the effects of the occupation on health, and they found the following. Um, and this was actually from a report um, on, from Palestine Monitor in 2010 as part of UNICEF. They said that the Israeli, and as part of their research, they found that the Israeli checkpoints and roadblocks, the separation wall and the military presence heavily limited access to medical equipment and medicine. It compromised the education of healthcare professionals. We just saw that schools out, schools out for an entire population of folks, imagine. Um, and it also blocks access to both preventative and curative health services. When you think about it, the isolation and fragmentation of healthcare due to the Israeli wall impaired provisions for about 20% of the population, specifically in the West Bank. That's what this report found. And in one year, medical personnel encountered about 929 incidents at checkpoints, resulting in loss of over 11,000 work hours when transporting critically ill patients and patients seeking specialty care 
across the border wall. Um, and so as part of this research, they actually monitored 50 checkpoints. And according to the lead, lead research, um, lead researchers, um, the delays took anywhere from two to 30 minutes to transport criti critically ill patients. Um, we can move on to the next slide. Yep. Um, just again, on those same barriers to care, um, they observed a trip where a PMRS vehicle, like an ambulance, was stopped and searched, and at least uh, twice, at least twice while they were trans trying to transport a girl who was seven or eight years old to a specialty care clinic. Under international law, medical providers need to be allowed to be to expedite passage, um, and uh, waits at checkpoints are unacceptably commonplace. Um, and, and when it comes to transport, this study also found that one doctor said at checkpoints, they try to humiliate you because you are a doctor specifically. Uh, let's keep moving. Um, more on the Palestinian health care system. Um, this kind of shows you uh, a few of the factors that go in to create and manifest disease specifically in the Palestinian population. Um, a lot of these factors to care specifically um, target Arab populations and when compared to the robust medical care that uh, Jewish Israelis receive and are allowed to receive freely um, at uh, in mainland Israel, um, it is very clear medical apartheid. We can keep moving. Let's talk about permits. Um, so when you destroy all the cancer hospitals and you destroy all the infrastructure for health, you ban cement, you ban travel, you cut off the electricity, water, and you cripple um, an entire population with sanctions. Um, this is, you might be wondering, what is the point of targeting all this, um, you know, civilian infrastructure? Well, this is all part of a strategy, not to be evil just for evil's sake, but it's part of a strategy as part of ethnic cleansing. It's that simple. It's not out of hate. It's not out of a religious fight. It's about ethnic cleansing. And so that looks like destroying the infrastructure of a region of a population you're hoping to displace and then ultimately facilitating their death or displacement. And so with the permit system, they seek to do exactly that. Um, you can kind of see the difference in healthcare outcomes um, and uh, how these permits end up manifesting. So um, let's look at the Physicians for Human Rights Israel chapter who did a report about, I think it was last year or two years ago, mm -hmm. and they said about 40 patients with cancer and cardiac problems have died in recent months after being refused permission to leave through the crossing by Israel's military and intelligence services. They say that permits are often withheld for unspecified security reasons, even though cancer patients and other critically ill patients have been accepted for referral by hospitals in Israel, the West Bank, Jordan, or Egypt. The Palestinian Ministry of Health estimated that about 800 patients of all ages and both sexes um, needed to leave Gaza for treatment, and some were already previously receiving treatment outside of the Gaza Strip. Uh, but that treatment has stopped, and those territories have been progressively sealed off. I did want to just mention that Physicians for Human Rights, who has been working to secure those permits, found a decline from 67 to 7% over the past year in the acceptance for permits mm. for folks to seek care elsewhere. Um, next slide, please. Um, how are we doing on time? You're good. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good deal. So part of the strategy to cripple, um, to deprive a population of proper access is to deprive their ability to communicate, to join up their resources, to coalesce and uh, ally, ally with each other, um, in order, uh, to survive. And so part of the separation of Gaza and the West Bank and the partitioning of those areas, especially within the West Bank, serves to further create division, first serves to further alienate and uh, dispossess an entire population. Um, and this is something that we can see with maps of uh, the United States when they were displacing a Native American indigenous population. What you'll notice is they didn't just push them laterally, they actually broke them up into um, tiny juntas. So, um, I did want to just bring that up in this slide. Um, uh, in regards to disparity of access, um, this slide uh, particular, particularly brings attention um, to the disparities in health between those who are able to receive care in Israel versus those who are stuck or trapped within Gaza and the West Bank. Next slide. Yep. Um, more on the healthcare system prior to October 7th. So. When it comes to receiving care in um, the West Bank, for example, so we got to um, we got to hear about uh, uh, Dr. Hawesh's incredible work with um, Health for Palestine and, and some of my uh, uh, experience working in the West Bank with community health workers 
um, in, in, in a very similar strain revealed to me how crowding, overcrowding, uh, movement restrictions, uh, uh, siege in general uh, when it comes to resource deprivation, uh, how that affects and manifests disease across an entire population. It is a wholesale punishment. Um, the aunties can't get to their foot care appointments, cannot follow up with their diabetes specialists because the camps are so, to get in between these camps, the walls are so thin that a backpack cannot even get through. I mean, we have to find other ways to get to the aunties so we can take a look at the bottom of their feet so that we could check their blood sugar, blood pressure. Um, and so um, I think that out, you know, not, not to just talk about the despair um, or, or the uh, overwhelming disparity of healthcare access, but we should also talk about the encouraging and beautiful resilience and the creative solutions um, that people like our brave Resmi um, uh, may his soul rest in peace. Um, we're working tirelessly to, to uh, uh, implement in order to meet folks where they were at to solve these restrictions. And um, they pay the ultimate price for it. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is more on the deprivation of resources in um, the health uh, healthcare scene in Gaza. Just imagine when you look at a map of where all the proton therapy centers are to get care for your cancer. What you'll find is across the entire Middle East, there's going to be one center in like the Levant. You know, there may be some in the Gulf regions, but in the Levant, there's one and it is going to be in Israel. That means if you'd like or if you're qualified to receive proton therapy, there's nothing that can support you in Gaza. You will have to go through that same permit system to receive that in Israel. And as you can see, there's no PET scan, or PET scan or CT scanner in the Gaza Strip, which as an emergency medicine physician, that CT scanner is everything. And I cannot imagine doing my job without it. Mm. It is a death sentence without a CT scanner. Um, next slide. Um, you'd think that for those who weren't living under a besieged uh, 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 open air concentration camp like in Gaza would have at least uh, those democratic freedoms that Israel purports to offer its uh, citizens. But what we're forgetting is apartheid. And so that does not apply if you're Arab. If you're Arab, rather, um, Arab inhabitants, even within mainland Israel, are heavily stifled from saying anything to stop an active genocide happening next door. Um, in the clip that you see here, it's not actually a clip, but you see Israeli security forces approaching a store owner asking him to open his phone so they could see whether he supports Hamas and ultimately arresting him um, in my experience in the uh, uh, in Jerusalem I had a you know I was not arrested but I was uh, heavily brutalized asked for my phone to be open and I was threatened with being strip searched after getting whooped by the IDF um, simply for walking to the mosque to make prayer. Um, you know, I was like 17. So anyway, I have no problem believing this. I have no problem believing this because I've literally been threatened with being stripped and beaten um, um, simply for existing and being Arab. Uh, next slide. Um, let's talk a little bit about settler colonialism. So this is a concept that we have to talk about when we want when we're seeking to understand the the situation in Palestine and Israel. It is a textbook example of settler colonialism. And typically the problem, as our U.N. spokesperson um, said in regards to genocide in identifying genocide has been um, the fact that genocide happened so subtly. Um, the, the perpetrators of genocide never openly admit to their intents. However, what's so different about this situation is that it's so open. It's, it's such an open conquest of uh, territory and displacement of a people. Um, and so we can actually look at a, you know, when you see settler colonialism in Palestine, you actually see it in a fishbowl. You see it in a perfect and pure form that you can then apply to the set, situation of settler colonialism all over the world, including in the U.S. Um, next slide. Mm -hmm. Um, and when we talk about occupation, it's almost always purported to be this temporary solution. Most recently, we've heard how, um, you know, Israeli officials and U.S. state heads have been pressuring Arab leaders um, to open their borders, not for aid, not to bring in equipment, necessary life-saving stuff, but to open those borders so that we can dispossess those Palestinians and rush them to other surrounding Arab countries. Um, and and they are purporting this plan as part of a temp temporary project and that those people are somehow going to return. Um, and that when you look at the map of Israel, you'll see how uh, over time you'll see how it is going to be impossible for that to happen, as this is actually a very intentional part of a plan to ethnically cleanse a population. There's absolutely no intent for those people to return. I did want to mention when it comes to occupation, there are rules. 
I know it sounds kind of messed up, but when it comes to an occupying force that is, uh, uh, I guess, tasked with protecting a population who it is seeking to eradicate a um, uh, um, uh, um, an enemy from their midst, uh, there are actually requirements internationally for how that occupying force is to act. And so that involves ensuring that they have access to water, access to care for communicable diseases. And when we look at the direct targeting and bombing of hospitals, healthcare workers, first responders, EMTs, and the restrictions to their movements, we see how the exact opposite is in effect. Next paragraph. Yeah, and I just wanted to add to what Soheb is saying, a temporal project, a temporary project of occupation. We see home demolitions to be such a consistent part of that in the West Bank, and there's nothing really temporary about destroying a home that stood there for centuries, something that's held the universe, a life of that this family shared. And all of the home demolitions are done on the premise that there was no permit for that home. Well, some of these homes existed before the state of Israel. And not only that, when people then apply for a permit, over 90% of them are rejected. Um, yeah, sorry. Go on. So I no, go off. Go and that's, off. Yeah, go off. <laughs> um, sorry, the see. font is kind of small. Oh, no worries. My bad. Um, but uh, no, uh, please. I was just going to mention how um, this is just part of the continu the, the the partitioning of the West Bank is just part of the um, uh, the continued strategy to divide a population, to cut them off from supporting each other, and to ultimately partition them into easy to manage compartments for easier displacement um, and control later on. Next slide. Next slide. Um, so what we're seeing right now in Palestine is uh, a textbook example of apartheid. Um, you see the um, labeling of entire population. You see roads that are, um, these are Arab roads, and then these are Jewish roads. Um, so Isra Israeli Jews can move along this road, and Arabs must use this road. Arabs have to move through, um, and, and especially in like occupied Hebron and um, in the West Bank, you'll find uh, uh, basically cages that Palestinians have to walk through. And these are the sidewalk that they're allowed to walk on, um, whereas Israelis may feel free to walk on the street or the sidewalk and pass without having their ID pulled or asked to justify their travel, et cetera. And and so having literally walked on a street with a chain link fence in between you and the other side of the street, one side of the street is um, covered in dirt and is unpaved. The other side of the street, I mean feet across from you, is perfectly paved, is safe, and is not being monitored in the way that the other side of the wall or this other side of the chain link fence is. Um, and that extends to healthcare outcomes too. So in the same way that the road was unpaved and um, it was being surveilled and policed and restricted, the healthcare systems and in turn, the health outcomes for Palestinians um, reflect the exact same. And so um, the work that scholars have been doing in recent years has been to actually put health outcomes from folks in Israel and health, health outcomes of folks in the West Bank and Gaza right up next to each other so that we can see visually apartheid in action. Um, next slide. Yeah, and do you, I just wanted to add one more thing, you know, sorry, to, I, just to what Soheb is saying, this dividing and this fracturing of society. The West Bank is divided into three areas, A, B, and C. C, under the complete military and, and civil control of the Israeli government. And in Area C, they're not allowed to build hospitals. There are 300,000 people living in Area C, which, as Soheb described, is incredibly compact. And, and incredibly dangerous for Palestinians, and they aren't even able to build their own infrastructure. And I just wanted to add here, this is just a, we're not gonna read it out, but this is a testimony from a doctor, a Palestinian doctor who works in the Israeli healthcare system within the Green Lines. All right, take it away, Soeb. Um, no, I, I think that's uh, it's important to highlight because the the doctor in the quote that you had mentioned earlier, basically he mentions how he uh, trains at an Israeli, uh, um, it's a hospital or a, a, a medical school in Tel Aviv, and he's one of four or six Palestinians there. Um, and the the head doctor, his seniors basically tell him, oh, you know, like I didn't, the Palestinians who work here are almost all janitors. Like there's no Palestinian doctors who work in this hospital. And so it's like so reminiscent of 
a lot of what you might hear in Jim Crow or in situations of apartheid and colonialism all over the world. It's a universal experience, and this experience happened um, um, in, in, in recent years. Um, lastly, we want to talk, uh, uh, well, not lastly, but I wanted to mention um, uh, apartheid manifests in health outcomes as well, and in this case, vaccination. So um, I wanted to just uphold the memory of uh, Razan Najjar, who was killed in the um, a healthcare worker who was killed in um, uh, in 2020, I believe. 2018. Um, Great 20 March of Return, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, and while she was delivering healthcare, again, just demonstrating the targeting specifically of healthcare workers and services, I think the Great March of Return was significant for the international the international outcry that the killing of specifically healthcare workers on the front line had raised um, from international orgs and uh um, humanitarian aid. Um, I did want to mention this, um, the gap in vaccination. So um, you'll kind of notice how apartheid has even manifested in the rate of folks who have been able to get vaccinated, um, both in Israel and in um, Palestine. Um, we, we, I'll actually pass off this um, last point in regards to medical apartheid. However, I did want to mention when it comes to permits and movement restrictions, that same PMRS um, study actually got uh, key informant interviews from first responders and ambulance drivers. And one of the one of the key informants basically uh, described a situation. I'll actually read it to you all. He says, while I was driving, he was driving a sick patient. While I was driving, two tanks stopped my ambulance and blocked me. Two to three soldiers were shooting at the ground in the sky, and they told me to get out with my hands up. Then the soldiers strip searched me. They made me take off all my clothes. The soldiers made me stay two hours in the hot sun. They turned off the ambulance, so there was no air conditioning for the patient. I kept begging them to let me go to the patient. Finally, they let me. When I went to check the patient's pulse, I realized that the patient had died. This type of humiliation and specific targeting of medical personnel is a humanitarian uh, is a is a humanitarian emergency, and it has been allowed to continue um, alongside settler violence and movement restriction in Palestine and the West Bank, and has led to a nine year difference in life expectancy and a six fold difference in the infant mortality rate for those living under apartheid. And I also wanted to share an anecdote, another anecdote of uh, Palestinian doctors within the Green Line living and working within Israel who had set up a COVID-19 testing facility for Palestinian Israelis and were subsequently arrested because they were told that this is actually an action and a political movement as part of the PA. So these people just simply who were providing a COVID-19 testing facility were criminalized inherently because of who they are. And honestly, the center was actually open to everyone. It wasn't just for Palestinians living within Israel, but because they had taken that independent decision themselves, they were criminalized. Um, I think we might move past this slide in the interest of time, Zuhayb, just uh, because we do have a question uh, and answer session with hopefully one more guest, Dr. Sayed Al Sayed, uh, joining us. All right, so I'm going to move on to public health crisis. Starting here, we have Bilal. Thank you, Sohib, so much, firstly, for uh, joining us. And thank you for sharing. Yes, please. Thank you for sharing your personal stories and experience working in Palestine. Me and Sohib actually just got to know each other this week, but it kind of felt like I was speaking to my old friend uh, over the phone. So, inshallah, we'll meet, in soon, meet soon. Uh, and Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. And we'll have a question and answer session with everyone towards the end, inshallah. Okay, so public health crisis, right? This is screaming public health crisis. But I want to start off with this picture. This is Bilal from Al Sawiya near Nablus. Bilal is a olive farmer. He was going into the fields, harvesting his olives as he does every year. And he was shot by a settler. This settler was armed, most likely, by the Israeli government. We know because of you know, a recent report from the, um, I believe it was the president, that they were handing out 10,000 assault rifles. And these people are already heavily armed and already, you know, see many Palestinians that live around them in the West Bank as criminals. And this man was killed in cold blood while holding the symbol of peace itself, an olive branch. I mean, if that says, that doesn't say something, I don't know what does. Um, 
And, you know, the attacks on al- uh, agriculture mean a lot in terms of food insecurity. So prior to this, you had 70 percent approximately of those in Gaza and in the West Bank as food insecure under threat of insecurity, as according to the Food and Ag- Agriculture Organization. And the attack on agriculture and this heavy militarization at this current moment, this is the olive harvest. People in Palestine, their entire livelihood is actually dependent on this harvest. And they are under threat of being killed by settlers in the military and cannot provide for their families because they are, you know, criminalized on their own land. And as they walk and try to pick their own harvest off their own land, they are killed or threatened. And this, I mean, it's really only one time of year that they're able to harvest and sell this. So this can really set people back significantly. And not only that, but heavy bombing and artillery and white phosphorus, as we've seen to be used and confirmed by Amnesty International, can completely destroy the land. And unfortunately, even in past aggressions in 2021, when we had Sheikh Jarrah, Many, many farmlands were actually just completely razed to the ground uh, by settlers and by the military as a show of force and as a threat. And this is, as I said, people's livelihood. And as uh, Suhaib and as uh, Dr. Hawash had mentioned, schools being shut uh, can completely deter and completely throw children and young adolescents off of track. I mean, we saw what that did to COVID. I think many of us know what that did to our uh, our younger generation here. And imagine thinking that, oh, I can't go to school because my school was destroyed or I can't go to school because the trip there might put me under threat of dying. I mean, 205 educational facilities have been destroyed. Eight of those were used as emergency shelters. And then 29 of them were under schools and many UN officials have also been killed. Um, You know, and Chicken pox, scabies, and diarrhea are significantly increasing, and these are diseases that we see that spread in times of, um, you know, destruction of infrastructure. And, oh, I got to change it on both slides. There we go. You know, as it goes to water, groundwater production right now in Gaza is less than 5% of what it was pre-October 7th, and it really was not that much beforehand. Uh, sewage pumping stations are non-operational and that risks flooding and that risks infection. Um, the spread of chemical and biological contamination is uh, increasingly possible. There will be increased risks of waterborne diseases, uh, dehydration, hunger and skin infections, uh, infections such as cholera, shigella and parasitic infections as well as you know viral meningitis can spread in these mediums. And then Prior to this, more than a quarter of all the reported disease in Gaza was caused by poor water quality and access. I mean, if you're going to mercilessly mercilessly bomb one of the most densely populated areas with barely any functional infrastructure, one that had just rebuilt its infrastructure or tried to rebuild its infrastructure from May 21 to smithereens once more, I mean, what what foundation and what ground do these people have to stand on? Um, And if it continues this way, disease outbreak and other water-related public health crises are um, incredibly possible and incredibly dangerous. I can't go through all of this, but, you know, I highly suggest everyone just go on Visualizing Palestine. They have some really great graphs. And just take a look at that, and I'm going to just talk, but it really just kind of explains how all of these forces coalesce. Um, So the main source of Gaza's water is its its aquifer, and it's being depleted. And its quality is diminished by the wastewater seepage, by uh, artillery fire and bombs that actually spread polluted particles into the water and come into the aquifer. Uh, This an inconsistent energy supply greatly limits its operation. So in terms of treating wastewater and treating the the seawater, it's um, it's incredibly difficult and incredibly dangerous because this will continue to build and the risk of disease will continue to build and uh in 2018 there was a study the famous study many of us probably heard of about how 97 percent of the drinking water in Gaza is unfit for consumption so i don't know what the final three percent how much of the final three percent remains but there needs to be considerable investment in in building you know a sustainable infrastructure to clean the water and also make water available beyond just this one aquifer <coughs> Sorry. And um, something that really struck me from the study this is the last point in the slide. In Gaza schools, there is an average of one toilet stall per 75 children and one sink per 80 children. 
which as we know kids you know are they they really know how to carry infections and that's just it, unfortunately it's going it leads to spread of these things that oftentimes spread by uh, surfaces and through hands and not being able to clean properly as we know is a huge huge risk of uh, continued progression of these infectious diseases um, so public health obviously related to employment creating livelihood having some form of uh, stability for yourself and in Gaza the unemployment rate is basically almost every it's two-thirds of the, the the population are unemployed and in times like this obviously everyone is unemployed and even in the West Bank and heavy heavily militarized areas outside of area a which includes Ramallah um, people are stopped from working and there's heavily heavier surveillance and more checkpoints so people can't go in to work um, as they normally do. And I think as Suhaib had mentioned, uh, many Palestinians actually are forced to work within the Green Line, within Israel, and go through hours and hours every day of waiting in these checkpoints, uh, presenting these IDs to them. And in times of crisis like this, they face increased risk of you know not maintaining their employment. And if they don't show up, they'll probably just get fired. Um, and you know the social determinants of health. We hear about this all the time, especially my uh, my you know my people here in medicine. We lo they love to talk about the social determinants of health, but they don't like to do much about it. Um, you know, I'm just going to read them out to you, and then uh, obviously we see that it is applies to Palestine. So violation violations of the host of their rights and ability to work, right to housing, the inherent right to life, the right to engage in political activity the right to liberty and security, the right to an adequate standard of living education, and the right to be free from arbitrary interference from one's privacy, family, and home. I think all of us here can agree that all of these are being attacked currently and have been under attack for as long as the occupation has existed. All right. So I'm going to then kind of break this down uh, for everyone into like different units and systems. So I started with chronic disease management. Chronic diseases, as you know, for those that don't know, non-communicable diseases. These are diseases that can't be transferred. Things like cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, strokes, uh, asthma, and other respiratory illnesses. These have actually sh been shown by the UN and other multinational NGOs to be the largest and mo the fastest growing reason for um, death and illness in the global south beyond just the infectious diseases, right? And, you know, 350,000 in the, in the West Bank are suffering with chronic conditions like diabetes or kidney failure, cancer and heart disease. We know about the destruction of infrastructure and access and how difficult it can be to manage. And as many of people in healthcare know, some of these conditions require consistent follow-up. That just And some permits take six months to a year to arrive. Well, then what are you going to do when your heart failure, when your, you know, your heart failure gets worse in a matter of a month and you can see a doctor in eight, right? Um, so, you know, we, we, we see that cardiovascular disease is the first leading cause of death among Palestinians, and then cancer was the second leading, and then um, complications of diabetes came forth, and, um, you know, a big part of the work they do with the community health worker training is diabetes screening. Right. So if they're not able to get across to a hospital in East Jerusalem, well, then at the very least, you can have people in the community that are screening your diabetes and making sure you're not going to have ketoacidosis, um, which is extremely dangerous complication of diabetes. And probably I think the most common thing I see in any public hospital in New York City um, and key key to this. Right. Um, it's a small point. My slides are incredibly dense. Wow. Um, the fifth, the, the last point, respiratory illnesses. The buildup of dust and asbestos and the, the waste products of explosives are incredibly dangerous, incredibly dangerous and become embedded in people's lungs and will lead to the development of chronic respiratory illnesses that are impossible to treat. You just manage them. You live with it and you manage with it, but you cannot treat these things. All right. Okay, so, you know, we talked about the absence, uh, that we talked about the, the inadequate infrastructure, we talked about the fragmentation of the system. Um, and something I wanted to mention, right, we talked about how people have to require permits. So the way permits happen, and this is important to say, the way permits happen is that clinics and hospitals in Gaza and the West Bank have to uh, 
send a referral and they pay. They pay for the hospital in Israel or in Egypt or in Jordan or in East Jerusalem. 40% of the Palestinian healthcare system, 40% of its budget is just paying. Just paying for referrals. Imagine what that 40% could do if you reinvest it in creating a sustainable Palestinian healthcare system. 40%. Right. So we don't have a clear universal policy and there is fragmentation within the system. You have your NGOs, you have your uh, mobile clinics, you have the UN, you have the PAs, uh, hospitals and clinics that have been open since uh, Oslo. And then you've also got the donations and the private hospitals that come from Indonesia and the Gulf. Right. But there is a lack of unified protocols between these and there is a lack of unified guidelines and treatment. So people are actually being treated differently from facility to facility. And you can imagine that that even continues when being referred outside. Right. So um, I'm just going to move on to the. I'm um, move on to the next slide, but just one more thing, you know, addition to, addition to all of that, people's physical status and the decompensation that occurs with continued lack of access then turns into another factor for why people don't seek care. You know, that's such a common thing in public hospitals in New York, right? Um, people are just like, oh, I can't, I can't make it because I can't walk or I can't make it because I don't have anyone to take me to my appointment. And then that ends up becoming this endless cycle where people keep getting worse and then don't feel the capability to leave and go to a hospital. They keep getting worse and they don't go. And that is the cycle that happens in false scene. Um, so this is from a qualitative study on the experiences of cancer patients being uh, treated from the West Bank. So I'm just going to read it because these are actual cancer patients uh, from the West Bank. 38-year-old woman, my health insurance was cut. If I wanted to go and renew my health insurance, it would take me months and I don't know what will happen to my health state in that time. There are some days when the medication chemotherapy is there and at other days the medications are not. So they're obliged to postpone giving medications to patients until they arrive. We are also faced that this medication comes from Israel and Israel gives the medication according to the number of patients they have. It does not give them in large quanti quantities, uh, only based on the number of patients who need it. If they have 800, they send 800. I mean, first things first. You know, as many of us know, things are incredibly inefficient hospitals. You don't know who shows up to your doorstep. And a lot of the time, there's going to be more than what they send in, in these requests. So there's always a deficiency. The last one, from March till August, I was going from a physician to another until they were able to do a CT scan for me. Then we knew in October they took the biopsy, and I'm stage four. And in the case of cancer patients, these delays are the difference between life and death. Women's health, okay. All right, so first things first, in Gaza right now, it's impossible to, to have any sort of hygiene management uh, for menstrual hygiene management. So many women have been taking uh, contraceptive pills or hormone pills to stop their periods due to lack of sanitary pads and water for washing. So there are an estimated 84,000 pregnant women in Gaza, and they're unable to access essential health services. They're unable to do their scans. They're unable to follow up with their physician when they see a couple spots of blood they're unable to uh really even know whether this baby they're carrying inside them is going to see life or not so in the next month 5,500 are anticipated to give birth and we imagine that many more will or we know that many more will and then 120 to 130 newborns this is actually al shifa i didn't mention um uh, it's between a, a couple of hospitals in the north but 100 to 123 line electric incubators and with the lack of fuel right? People, hospitals run out of electricity. Gaza's hospitals run on fuel. They do not have an electrical grid. I don't know if we mentioned this. So the lack of fuel means that any moment the hospital can just shut down and every single one of those babies in the incubator, incubators won't make it. All right. And also people in the ICUs. Um, so food insecurity is a big, big issue when it comes to maternal health, right? Women who are pregnant require adequate nutrition and hydration um, and, you know, in order to breastfeed um, and in order to maintain uh, a certain level of health uh, during pregnancy. So it risks anemia, preeclampsia and hemorrhage. So preeclampsia is such a risky, uh, it's, a, it's a very, very um, risky condition that many pregnant women face because it can develop into eclampsia, which means, you know, 
uh, the elevation of blood pressure as well as the occurrence of seizures during pregnancy. And without the adequate medications for seizures, without the ability to get to a hospital in time to treat such seizures, seizures can be permanently, permanently affect one's neurological health and kill them. Um, so this increased state of stress that these women have, are forced to be in, pregnant, without the necessary support and without the means of reaching a healthcare facility if they need it, means that, you know, one, they're increased risk of having these outcomes, and two, and if they do, there's no one to help them. So 150 women are giving birth every day. There's no tele, well, there minimal telecommunication now to call ambulances, no pain medications, no antibiotics as w for one to, that gives birth. Uh, there's new life in the surrounded by death. And uh, nursing mothers need additional water for normal breastfeeding. And um, as we know, water is in short supply. Um, and as many of us who you know have worked in medicine know, antibiotics are key once you're uh, in the birth giving process. So the risk of infection for these babies can lead to stunted growth and death for both the mother and the baby, right? Um, we talked about the permits and just, you know, I, I put in postpartum depression at the end because I mean, it goes without saying, but you know, postpartum depression is, uh, is an occurrence that many women face no matter their socioeconomic status, but one can imagine amongst the destruction and, and amongst the death. And for those women that have lost family members, um, you know, this it can be detrimental and it will most probably be in higher occurrence. Um, so as we said, increased stress affects breastfeeding. Home births have, are now sometimes the only option, which lead to increased propensity of infection and complications. If the baby is breech, if the feet are down and the head isn't, that is incredibly dangerous for the health of the baby and the mother. If there's an umbilical cord tied around the baby's neck, these things are incredibly common, no matter where you are in the world. And in, in situations of increased stress and duress, when people's health and when people are forced to walk miles after their home has been destroyed or when they're told to evacuate the north to the south, that is, um, you know, that's an ingredient for disaster, or a recipe for disaster, rather, sorry. Um, and, you know, we want to talk, I just really wanted to say this very quickly, loss of partners. Um, people always talk about children and women that die in Gaza, and I think that that is incredibly important to highlight. But, you know, Oftentimes the idea of men, just for inherently being Palestinian men, they're just criminals and they don't really talk about that. But imagine like you lose your life partner while you're pregnant or while you're raising young children and you may not necessarily be employed uh, or able to support your family. I mean, just imagine the situation that one must face, you know. Uh, moving on to children's health. We saw the statistic that recently came out. One child died every 10 minutes in Gaza. 192 families have been wiped off their civil registry, most of them children. 3,024 children and 2062 were, were killed and 2,062 are still missing. That These are likely underestimates. Um, you know, and we really just need to think, I, what are the long-term consequences of first-hand violence and death and destruction? What kind of scars does that leave on one's mental health? And how do those scars and their mental health ultimately affect their physical health and their well-being and their ability to connect and form communities and, and feel supported? I mean, it can be incredibly isolating. I, I, how can, what do we say to a five-year-old who's watched their parents die? I have no idea. I, you know... And beyond mental health, uh, this can lead to lifelong chronic uh, injuries that will require consistent follow-up and, and you, consistent surgical procedures that people can't afford and there might not necessarily be space or resources for. So they'll be forced to live with the long-term consequences of these injuries. And um, the work that Dr. Hawash does is so essential because there's a lot of training and support required for those with intellectual disabilities and special needs in Palestine. And uh, right now, there's obviously very little for that. Um, so a study called Trapped in 2022 was discussing the confining of the younger generation and the effects on the mental health of the younger generation. So um, of those, this is in Gaza, uh, ch ch there are 84% in 2022 who described feeling fearful, 80% described nervousness, and you can see compared to 2018, the numbers, how they've jumped, because there was the attack in May 2021, and imagine what this attack right now, something we've never seen really ever happen before, how that will cause these numbers to jump once more, um, you know, and it's a very sad reality, but 
in this study, they said more than half of these children have contemplated suicide and three out of five are self-harming. There are other studies that have different numbers, but they're all quite shocking. I'll get to that in a little bit. And there, unchilding is a concept that's been described by certain Palestinian physicians. And unchilding is really this sort of criminalization, racialization, and this, this sort of statement that the world is giving these children that you are not protected. There's nothing you can do or your family can do to protect you from this state, from this settler colonial project. And the message that these children are receiving subliminally or actually not so subliminally is that you are lesser. You are lesser. Your life is less valuable. And they see that from a very young age. So just imagine that impact of the lasting impact of that. And, you know, these children in Gaza, many of them have seen six escalations of violence and they're not even 18 years old. And we have 500 to 700 children at any time being detained and prosecuted in the military court system. And I wanted to highlight that because I just wanted to move to one case, right? Um, many of you might have heard of Ahmed. Ahmed was arrested in November 2015. He was 13 years old. He was threatened and insulted uh, and that, you know, to be beaten and, and to be arrested. And, you know, they basically forced a charge on him. Um, the interrogation video was released a month, a month later, actually, and nothing happened. So he went to prison on these charges that he had admitted to because he was forcibly coerced without the presence of a lawyer or an adult. Again, he was 13 years old. I wouldn't put the video here, but you can see the video online. Um, he was held in solitary confinement since November 2021, and he only gets a hearing every six months to release himself from solitary confinement. He spent nearly two years um, in solitary confinement. His mental health deteriorated, and he was um, and he has been diagnosed with schizophrenia and severe depression with suicidal ideation. Uh, he was transferred to Ilon, which is a mental health hospital. But once his treatment, which will be a lifelong process, but once they deem his treatment is over, he will be returned to solitary confinement, which, I mean, is criminal. And, you know, international law it has no teeth, obviously, a lot of the time. But they do designate, they have rules about this. And they say, you know, solitary confinement for over 15 days is considered torture. Um, he was in solitary confinement, as I said, for two years straight. There's obviously been no investigation into the conduct of the officers. Uh, displacement and housing is a huge aspect of Palestinian life in the West Bank with the home demolitions as well as in Gaza with the complete... Uh, artillery and bombing of the city and destruction of entire residential neighborhoods. Um, what you can't see is on the right, that's Washington Heights, and on the left, that's Gaza. So on October 19th, Israel bombed 25 residential buildings in Al-Zahra, an area equivalent to five uh, New, New York City blocks. More than 9,500 Palestinians were displaced in a single night. And they've destroyed, that statistic is still, is actually uh, underestimate. It's now 49% of homes in Gaza have been destroyed. 49% of homes, I mean, the numbers, I, I can't even wrap my head around them sometimes. So 1.4 million people internally displaced. There have been orders to evacuate in the northern half of Gaza evacuating the hospitals. 600,000 internally displaced people are sheltered in 150 UN facilities, which are obviously not um, protected from bombing. Uh, there's been massive displacement to shelters, and a lot of these shelters don't have adequate resources, and they become the sites for a uh, disease outbreak. And uh, as I said earlier, 35 UN staffers have been killed. Forced displacement has been a big uh, topic in migration and health recently, um, and it exposes those that are displaced to uh, you know, various stress factors. It's a significant cause of depression, anxiety, and PTSD. It leads to discontinuity of care, which can complicate people's conditions, as we discussed with chronic disease management. Uh, the unstable lived environment is another added factor to both the physical and mental health. Exposure to infectious diseases, as we saw uh, in Al uh, Quds Hospital and Al Shifa, you have 45,000 people taking shelter in a hospital. The hospital is already, as many of us know, a huge, huge place for infection. I mean, like when you don't have people sheltering there, a lot of people catch infections in the hospital, and a lot of people die because of it. It's one of the leading causes of death in hospitals in the United States. So when you imagine a hospital with 45,000 people sheltered, plus all the patients, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's a disaster waiting to happen. Um, 
And as we knew, we said earlier, this increased physical distress leads uh, to maternal and child mortality, increased maternal and child mortality in Gaza and the West Bank, six times uh, in the West Bank and nine times more in Gaza compared to Israel, uh, and increase of autoimmune illnesses incur in uh, uh, periods of increased stress and duress. Is this changing? All right. So restrictions on mobility. Um, I, it is just kind of reiterating, but preventing movement and access through the destruction of infrastructure and roads um, really complicates the delivery of aid and as well as the, the jobs that many of our heroic ambulance drivers and paramedics do on a daily basis. And that is a quote. Um, our focus is on damage, not precision. It's kind of always been on damage. All right, mental health, my favorite topic. Um, there's one psychiatric hospital in Gaza and there is, that was bombed on October 15th. And there's one in the West Bank. That's a picture of it. It's in uh, Bethlehem, Bethlehem. There are a couple of uh, centers and mobile clinics that provide care, three centers and five, in Gaza, five mobile clinics in Gaza, 13 community health, mental health clinics and centers in the West Bank. They mostly serve women and children and uh, people that are incarcerated. And there's no hotlines. And many of the professionals are also complaining right now of extreme trauma because of what they're enduring. Um, many people have described the buzzing of drones as one of these elements of in psychological torture that exists in the background for many Palestinians. And then one of their, you know, we have 32 psychiatrists across all of Palestine right now, which is, I'm 32 across the West Bank and Gaza. There are less than 20 in Gaza. I think it's somewhere in the order of 15, 16, and the remaining are in, West, in, in the West Bank. So they really do require, and I'm going to discuss this later, more training, direct care. They require a sort of robust network for hotlines and telemedicine. A reduction of stigma is a big problem. I think a lot of uh, Middle Eastern people know that mental health, and a lot of people that are not white, let's be frank, uh, are... Our older generations see, have a lot of stigma around this stuff, so that's definitely a problem in Palestine, too. Um, this is Dr. Samah Jabir. She is uh, she she's uh, one of the psychiatrists and, and mental health professionals in Gaza that talks about chronic traumatic stress disorder. There is no post-traumatic stress disorder in Gaza because people are just consistently exposed to the loss of loved ones. They don't have control of their lives, their mobility. They don't have self-determination. Right? They can't do. They can't get the work they want to work, and they can't go to the schools they want to go to. There's torture, which is a he. In I mean. I think there's a statistic of Amnesty International said 90% of those incarcerated in Palestine have experienced at least one form of torture. And currently, the prison population doubled since October 7th. So we have 10,000 people in prison. I mean, if we're saying 90% of them are getting tortured, I, I would argue that's probably more than that. Um, this is a quote from Dr. Samah. Uh, if the disease is political, then the solution also lies in the political ending the occupation and, and eradicating the structures of repression and inequality, right? Facts. Um, the Palestinian territories have some of the lar have the highest rates of depression in the Middle East region, the Eastern Mediterranean region, as the WHO likes to talk about it. Um, there's a, some studies have shown it to be around 18.5% in the Gaza and 23% uh, in the West Bank. That study, I believe, was from, if I have to say, I think it was from 2018. Uh, a study in 2014 showed a high prevalence rate of suicidal ideation and suicide attempts, 25% among adolescents. So we're saying one in four adolescents have contemplated and attempted suicide. And as another study showed, self-harming behaviors are rampant, three out of five in the sample that was studied. Males that are male adolescents were the highest risk group. Um, you know, and a lot of the times these Western measurements for depression and, and mental health uh, screening just don't really apply to the context because what people face is so unique, right? Um, and, you know, um, the highest rates of PTSD in Gaza are um, amongst the, the youngest generation. I'm not saying the numbers because we know Gaza is basically a city of children with over, you know, a million children. The highest rates are amongst children, all right? We talked about the, the, the no post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, you know, I'm gonna move on just in the interest of time. So there's some great grassroots organizations that we wanna shout out. The Palestine Global Mental Health Network that increases public aw awareness of psychosocial issues. 
um, and hinder the the hindrance on on colonized peoples of their dignified living. The Gaza Community Mental Health Program, which focuses on education and counseling, diagnosis and referral, and expanding the professional foundation of mental health professionals in Gaza. They do telemedicine. We're going to talk about this a little bit later. Later and uh, INARA. So Palestine is disability is a big disability issue, right? Palestine is a big disability issue. We saw 32,000 people injured just since October 7th. Uh, this is a quote from Elon Pape, former soldier in the IDF. Uh, actually, I don't know if many people knew that, but now scholar on Palestine and Israel. Israel pr Israeli practices of maiming indigenous Palestinians demonstrate systematic oppression, which deems the Palestinian body valueless as it is always the target within an ongoing Israeli ethnic, ethnic cleansing, genocide, and apartheid process. So in the first Intifada, which was a revolution in 1987 after the killing of four Palestinians in Gaza, actually, who were run over by a truck. Um, it led to mass demonstrations and protests, and a lot of the people were cracked down. Um, there was a broken legs policy by Yitzhak Rabin, who was, who's often touted to be the most liberal Israeli prime minister. Take that with a grain of salt, I guess. Um, his policy was to break the legs of all the peaceful protesters. And that is exactly what they did. Um, and there were 175,000 Palestinians arrested in that period of revolution. 80,000 injured, 5,000 of whom had permanent disabilities. And, um, you know, focused lethality mu munitions and, and, and weapons that are constantly just being tested on the population lead to unique injuries that doctors don't know how to treat and ultimately lead to amputations and permanent disabilities. Um, so in 2022, a study showed the pal from the Palestinian Center of Human Rights that disability, um, the number of those in, with disabilities was 93,000, 52% in, in Gaza. Um, these are the kinds of disabilities that exist in the distribution. Um, this is a quote from a recent article of a man in Gaza who um, relies on an electric wheelchair. Um, said, if I dial down my, home mo my own home, how can I go south? The destruction of infrastructure and roads complicates movement for those with mobility disabilities. And 46% uh, of those children with disabilities uh, are not enrolled in education and 90% of those with disabilities don't work, which only can further lead to a decompensation of their condition and makes things a lot worse and a lot more difficult for them. This is a, a, a wheelchair, a picture of a wheelchair basketball league that is exists in Gaza. This is, picture was taken in 2018. So the power outages and the lack of electricity actually really complicates the rights and freedoms of these vulnerable people who rely on this equipment to move and get around for assistive devices and not just, you know, getting around, but even like a hearing aid, for instance, the lack of batteries and abilities to charge them, right? Um, and many healthcare facilities, unfortunately, are ill-equipped in general and further ill-equipped to, to serve the needs of, of those Palestinians, excuse me, that are disabled. Um, you know, one out of five of those people with disabilities in the Palestinian territories are under 18. Um, and in 2019, I think this is just like a good thing to highlight, just a little bit of positivity. The first beach for people with disabilities was inaugurated in, in the we in west of Gaza City. So um, it is an accessible beach. Uh, for people to enjoy. All right, moving on to surgery. Um, I wanted to just show you Dr. Midhat Salem. Uh, Dr. Salem was killed um, a few weeks ago in the recent military onslaught. He is one of three board-certified burn surgeons in all of Gaza. Now there remains two. Um, but the most common injuries are blast injuries, with shrapnel and destruction and crushing injuries from infrastructure falling upon people. So these complex injuries with in such high volume, unfortunately, cannot be treated ad adequately. So doctors al oftentimes resort to amputation directly because it's a matter of life and death. Um, the corrupt equipment, the screws and implants for people's sizes and of their limbs are not available. So they're being fixed with things that don't fit them and will oftentimes lead to uh, maladaptive healing and then you know consistent sort of issues in the future there's obviously as as so have been mentioned severe limitations in experts uh, vascular surgery um, orthopedic surgery for instance and that 
you know, is incredibly pronounced. Now, many surgeons have been targeted and their families as well have been targeted. We showed a picture of those two uh, surgeons at the Indonesian hospital who had found out that their families, they, they are related, they found out that their entire family had been wiped out. And uh, there's not even one single trauma surgeon in all of Gaza, which is probably one of the most needed uh, specialties. Um, this is a quote from an orthopedic surgeon in Gaza. The only thing worse than the screams of a patient undergoing surgery without enough anesthesia are the terror-stricken faces of those awaiting their turn in these incredibly crowded spaces. People actually witness the surgeries. The OR and Al-Shifa Hospital will have at least 15 to 20 people just laying there while someone is being operated on because there is no space. Um, household vinegar, as Dr. Hawash mentioned, is being used as an infect disinfectant. Um, shortage of b bandages um, leads to, you know, wrapping whatever you can around these wounds, which increases the risk of infection and probably the risk of amputation. Um, experimental weaponry leads to unique injuries that surgeons don't know how to treat. They've actually found that recently there have been these particles that are pop and release under pressure, almost like an aerosol can, that get embedded in people's limbs. Um, and it's in nearly impossible to take out and imagine trying to take that out when the lights aren't on. Um, the 10 bed burn units in, um, is I think, uh, in Al Shifa, I should have noted that has around 70 patients. And, um, you know, we talked about white phosphorus and there's confirmed accounts from human rights watch. Um, I decided to maybe put one medical diagram in here, you know, just because burns, I think are something we should really understand. Um, Burns for people in medicine, as you know, are incredibly, incredibly time intensive to treat. You actually really need to keep people in the ICU for a while. They require intense nutrition and intense hydration to heal. And these things do not heal easily and they can lead to complications very easily. And a lot of, of patients are showing up with full thickness burns, meaning fourth degree burns, as that diagram shows, which have the highest risk for complications. Um, and, you know, with your experimental weaponry, you don't know the nature of what you're dealing with. And the treatment process and methodology depends on the nature of the burn. So a lot of doctors are kind of in the dark, literally and, and figuratively, when it comes to treatment. Um, what's going on? Is that it? Oh. Okay, cool. So we're nearing the end. Um, but really, this is something I, I borrowed from... Uh, incredible professor in public health, uh, Yara Asi. And this is her framework for moving forward. I wanted to read it. So moving beyond the humanitarian aid framework, the reliance on aid, although important, um, it does not solve everything, right? Collective power and solidarity networks are essential to defend the rights of Palestinians. Um, and things like this are essential in, in terms of changing the narrative, but also you know building groups of doctors that are capable of uh, providing support, right? So, you know, we can sign up for a telemedicine support for the, the it, you know, the Gaza Community Mental Health Initiative, which is something that um, hopefully we'll be working on soon in recruiting mental health professionals to do so. Um, building a telehealth program for experts to at least provide consultations outside of mental health too for the limited staff. And, you know, I think, you know, um, we need to understand that health systems in this is a po have political and historical context, right? And that does affect the way that they function. And decolonizing pol these these political and uh, these political constructs um, within the these health systems as best as we can, I think, is incredibly important, right? Um, if we can deconstruct them, obviously through you know um, political means, sure policy that's great but that might not happen for years and years and years so if we can organize and build collective power to at least create concrete relationships that are lasting with people in palestine and give them whatever we have which is our expertise and our ability to train then why not i mean we don't need to wait for that right and you know um this is something that we I'm hopefully aiming to kind of build as part of this uh, organization, you know, mental health training programs for crisis intervention, screening and suicide prevention, obviously through working with the grassroots organizations on the ground that exist, which we uh, currently have connections with. So 
having mental health professionals um, that are capable of, you know, assisting at these times available to train and, and be there for patients is essential uh, through telemedicine. And also, you know, uh, sessions for our community. I mean, we have hate crimes on the rise, um, Islamophobia and racism on the rise. Um, and, you know, a lot of our Jewish community that stand up for Palestinian rights actually face ostracization and isolation from their families and their communities, which is just not right because that's how they, they are, exerc you know, they are doing and, and, and speaking out for what they believe in um, as what their faith, at least the way they interpret their faith to, you know, the values that it imparts upon them. And it can be incredibly stressful and, and frustrating to, to be isolated. So building uh, communities for all of us to support one another, um, I think is, is really essential. Um, Dr. Hawash, are you here? I could go, I could talk a little bit about it. All right. Well, the, I, she may not be available right now. Um, hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey. Oh, yeah. Great. So, Hib also worked with Health for Palestine. So, Hib, you want to talk to them a little bit about it? I, I, uh, I haven't had Dr. Hawash is available. I actually yeah. want to give the floor to Oh, great. Okay. Hi, Dr. Hawash. Thank Sorry. you so much for all the information. I think... You gave a very vivid and detailed um, picture of how, what it means to be a doctor, what it means to be a nurse, what it means to be a therapist in Palestine, um, in Gaza, in the West Bank, in each one of our cities and villages. Uh, it's uh, a life full of challenges. And uh, what is inspiring is that even though there are so many challenges, there are good moments and uh, our people take care of each other. And I think probably the best times are there, <laughs> yeah. you know, so it's a, it's a good place to be. Um, so um, are we opening for a uh, question and answer or is there just, a certain thing? Yeah, that you just want? about, but I wanted you to just speak a little bit about um, the Health for Palestine um, organization and the work you do in a little bit more detailed way, because this is now talking about, you know, calls for action and how people can get involved. Yeah. Health for Palestine is a, a, a small organization, but it has grown. Um, the mission for Health for Palestine is health equity for Palestinians in refugee camps, health equity for Palestinian children in refugee camps. It started in Aida, in uh, Lajet Center, which is a community center uh, that serves the community there. And the focus uh, is on building the community by um, creating spaces for uh, people to uh, experience uh, joy in um, agriculture, experiencing joy in uh, community exercise uh, programs, which is a very common thing in our refugee camps. Our refugee camps are, they find spaces where they can be uh, supportive of each other and uh, the, the, where they can basically practice resistance in a positive way that is empowering for the children and empowering for the adults uh, and the camp in general. Um, and this, I have seen that in every camp that I visited. It's a very, very special community. Um, and uh, the work expanded to uh, Balata, and that's where I started uh, my work in Balata Yafa Center, Yafa Center. Balata is the biggest refugee camp in uh, in the West Bank. It's very crowded. It's um, it has thirty five thousand people. Uh, a lot of them are children. Um, the school system is through the UNRWA uh, system, and UNRWA has been defunded. Uh, several times, uh, in addition, uh, the humanitarian aid that is given to the Palestinian refugee camps is heavily restricted, uh, conditional, where they have to sign statements and do, you know, say 
agree with um, certain things that they do not uh, accept, um, and I don't blame them. So uh, there is a, a lot of uh, poverty, and the community has to lean on each other. And the community health worker model that uh, uh, I worked with in the, and you worked with too in uh, Palestine is very unique because the community health workers do not only ne need to be um, taking care of uh, the health of uh, their community members, they also need to build the resilience and the coping strategies and be there uh, in the camp after somebody is arrested or after somebody's house is demolished or after a child is shot. And uh, during my time uh, in Balata and in Aida, uh, you know, one day uh, is a day where we go around and visit the families of the people who were shot the night before. And the other day is uh, the day when we uh, see patients and elderly and children who need home visits to check their medications, check their blood pressure, uh, check their mental health. And I have seen how meaningful the com community health worker role uh, in uh, those uh, communities. Uh, community health workers become really champions. And uh, Rasmi Arafat embodied this, Allah uh, Yerhamu. He really took care of everybody around him and um, his loss is huge. That being said, his colleagues and his peers will continue and they will take care of um, uh, the other, uh, they will continue their mission and uh, one thing that one of the community health workers told me, uh, Mariam, when I was talking to her about, uh, you know, taking, uh, doing developmental medicine and taking care of children with autism when there are injured people every other day. And I was struggling with it because how can you just try to provide a normal or, you know, secure, safe um, environment for children with special needs when there is so much trauma around him, around them. And uh, she said to me, you know, one, one day there is the trauma and then we pick up the pieces and we have to live another day and we all need this help. Mm -hmm. So the refugee camps, um, even though the uh, the trauma is at a very, very high level, they also want their children to have opportunities. They want their children to go to good schools. They want them to do well when they graduate from high school. Every family is really supportive of the Taujihi student who has to study. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a very rich, complex kind of community that you know, as uh, for us as Palestinians in the diaspora, when we go there, I think we feel at home with that, with our people because of their warmth and their mm. care towards each other. And it's such a rewarding uh, experience. Yeah. I think, you know, personally, I think we benefit tremendously from being there. And we build this relationship with the community health workers. And really, we become like family. Um, things, uh, you know, another example for my work when I was in, the, in Aida, I was there and then one child, an 11 year old was shot because there is the tower, the sniper towers uh, in Aida. And the, chi the child was shot and he lost his finger. And we spent two hours looking for pieces for the finger, just, you know, to try to put it together. So this is the kind of daily life that people in the refugee camps have. Um, on a technical level, we try to build uh, programs where the community health workers can be effective in delivering care for chronic diseases like diabetes and hypertension. Um, children with developmental delay, we teach uh, them 
as non-specialists, how to become experts in screening and how to help families navigate the complex environment of finding resources for the, their children who have special needs. Um, so it's very, very important work. Uh, it's work under extreme trauma, under extreme stress, uh, from you know occupation, checkpoints, lack of services, discrimination, racism, incarceration, uh, indiscriminate execution at night, incursions at night uh, for the communities in Palestine. Um, so it's a very dangerous environment that is uh, the daily life there. And for uh, for us, uh, it, uh, you know, it's it's. I mean, I grew up there, so I'm used to it. But it still shocks me how we as Palestinians have endured such tremendous injustice every single day. Yeah. Thank you so much, Doctor Hawass, for for sharing your experience. Um, I wanted to before we get going, just introduce. Um, one more doctor who, you know, thankfully made time today uh, after his busy schedule, Dr. Osaid. He's a medical doctor from Gaza who is now working in the U.S., who's come to join us. Um, before we open it up to questions, I just wanted to see if there's anything he wanted to share with us. Uh, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Thank you guys for organizing this and I appreciate it. Um and sorry for missing the the first part. Um, I just wanted to share a few things, and I and I apologize if you guys already shared that. Um, so I so I grew up in in Gaza. I did medical school there. I worked there as a doctor as well. So I'm quite familiar with the with the how the healthcare system functions in Gaza, and, and I've been in contact with my um, you know friends and colleagues and mentors uh, back home. Um, so just to give an overview of how a, a emergent, uh, emergency uh, surgical procedures uh, have been uh, done over the last uh, uh, few days since October 7th. So as we know, baseline, the healthcare system is, uh, you know, near collapsing. And actually the Minister of Health and WHO announced that the healthcare system collapsed. And that d does affect the surgical, uh, you know, capacity and surgical system. Um, so, um, with the lack of um, many essential medications, including anesthesia and analgesia, mm -hmm. many surgical procedures, and I'm sure a, a lot of you guys have seen uh, many emergent surgical procedures, and that includes fracture fixation, uh, or what we call X-fix or external fixators, have been done in the uh, hallways, in the hospital hallways, in the OR holding area, which is supposed to just you know, keep the patient temporarily until they go inside the actual operating room. Um, and, you know, so for example, Shifa Hospital, which is the largest hospital in Gaza, uh, there's only um, like less than 10 operating rooms in the main uh, building, and they had to use the uh, obstetric and gynecology uh, operating rooms, which are less than five, to kind of, uh, you know, use them for that. And still they couldn't, you know, uh, function well and so that's why they had to use the hallways and like the OR holding air and all of that. So with the lack of medication, many procedures have been done under no sedation or very minimal light sedation as well. Um, and of course with lack of sterility as well and, and I've seen, you know, my friends sent me pictures and videos of wounds uh, in kids, especially in kids and they're already infected and a lot of them, they have like uh, maggots, like growing, like swimming in the wound, which is, you know, should not happen. I mean, you know, that just indicates severe, really severe infection. And as we know, like the uh, people have been flooding the hospital, including my family. My family actually lived in the hospital, luckily less than 24 hours because they were able to go back to their apartment. Um, so people are flooding the hospital. There's no, you know, sterility in many uh, of those urgent procedures. Um, and, of course, focusing on healthcare system, I think you guys already mentioned the impact on healthcare workers. You know, so far, uh, we've been building a database for all healthcare workers. So far, there's 140 um, medical or healthcare workers, including doctors, uh, surgeons. The only 
uh, like one of only three board certified burn surgeons was killed as well. So with the lack of staff as well, you can imagine the how surgeons and doctors have been functioning. I mean, even like if you, if, the last thing, if you if when I talk about burn, we've seen a lot of like politicness burns and all of that. And you know, I work in a burn center here as well, and we know burn is usually uh, most of the focus is based on the wound care, which is done by nurses. And um, so far, we had almost 50 nurses have been killed. So wound care is not ideal without our nursing colleagues as well. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things, and I'm sure you guys mentioned a, a bunch of them, but I just wanted to share that uh, before we take questions. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining and sharing that. Um, yeah, and it's it's so stark because, you know, so... It's so critical, the nursing staff, as many of us know who work in healthcare, the nursing staff really do hold things together and they have been uh, the highest number of casualties amongst all um, divisions in, in healthcare has been amongst nurses. So that support system is, um, is really being compromised. And, you know, in, in the interest of time, I'd say we just open up to questions for everyone. Um, apologies again for the late start and my technological my lack of technological capabilities um please if anyone has any questions or comments could you ask the doctors what message they have for us to bring to washington on saturday oh i mean i don't know uh said you you're the one who has contacts with uh doctors in gaza has there any message that they've told you to pass on for to the communities here in solidarity uh i mean yeah i mean i think the biggest thing is really advocacy i mean uh, i think whether we are in healthcare or not i think we should speak up we should uh, whether that includes talking to your representative in your state or talking to your hospital administration talking to your society for example if you are in a, any of the you know much needed specialty like surgery, anesthesia, uh, and the subspecialties within surgery, like, you know, ER, emergency, all of that. I think we need to basically mobilize and send, um, you know, those kind of uh, specialists and um, help out with the current situation. Obviously, the border is still closed, but, you know, closed for like missions, but hopefully will open soon. And then, uh, of course, we've seen like most big societies and, you know, um, hospitals issuing really, really awful statements supporting one side and ignoring uh, Palestinians, and which is unprecedented. Like in the previous uh, military attacks on, on Gaza and West Bank, we've seen like some sort of soft language and stuff, but now really harsh language just supporting uh, the occupation and just ignoring uh, Palestinians and the casualties and all of that so I think advocacy is a big thing um, and then comes everything else including donations and all of that yes Dr. Hawash can I uh, answer this question please? please yes I think what is needed is an immediate ceasefire that is what uh, that is the biggest demand and uh, stopping aid to Israel and ending the occupation. These are the biggest things. So if you go to uh, Saturday, if you meet with your senators, your representatives, any government officials, the, the, the clear message has to be to cease fire, end the occupation, end the siege, stop uh, military aid to Israel, and do not allow Israel to get away with this. Thank you so much, Dr. Hawash. Anyone else have any questions? Uh, this is a question that a uh, co-resident sent me who's listening at home. Um, so this is from, from her. Um, but it's about medical permits and kind of what percentage are, if, you, if anyone has an idea what percentage are being granted right now and if what, um, any ideas of what is making it through, what kinds of issues are making it through? The answer is zero. Okay. Right now it's zero. Yeah, unfortunately. And usually it's it's severely limited and uh, severely delayed. As we were talking about earlier, as Suhib had, had been, you know, had so eloquently laid out, it's, um, 
yeah, it's a travesty because now people are most in need of permits and hopefully, hopefully that will be changing soon. And can I add something really quick? So the only uh, the only surgeon that I'm aware of is in Gaza right now is Dr. Ghassan Abu Sitta, but he actually was in Gaza before the uh, October 7th. So he was there. He works for MSF and MAP UK or Medical Aid for Palestinians. So unfortunately, there's a lot of people who would like to come in, but, you know, the not just the permit, the border right now, Rafa, is not open for medical missions only open right now for certain uh you know nationalities to leave gaza mostly like americans or western european which is another layer of like racism and structural racism that is being imposed by the occupation in egypt unfortunately hmm. any other questions I did want to just add one last thing to yeah, um, sure. regards to permits. Um, just so you know, having to go through the permit system also means that your family in some way, shape or form is reliant on its standing with the Israeli government for that permit. That means that if members of your family are incarcerated, um, that means your house could be demolished and that permit removed. And so in a way, this is also a form of control. It's not just a pass to cross the border. Your access to that permit is heavily scrutinized and can be withdrawn at any moment. Mm. Yeah. Um, someone else had raised their hands. Yeah. Uh, is there any way that you know, I know that um, the medical supplies, majority of our hospitals have a lot of expired medical supplies that go to waste. I know that I've heard of one long time ago heard of an organization that was donating that to other countries um, is there a way we can gather those and send them at all how can we communicate with our hospitals and try to um, manage that or organize that if it's possible does anyone uh, want to speak on that or I can Um, Can I just add a quick comment? Yeah, uh, I, I don't know much about the logistics. I've never been part of a campaign that sends that. But please, please, please don't send expired equipment yeah. to any country. I think that's a concept that is already established in global surgery and global health. I, I think this should not happen even to Gaza, even the worst country or even the worst region. I know it comes from good intentions, but it should never be a thing. Um, just because, you know, you know, Gaza is under, like, it's, it has a collapsed healthcare system that should not mean that we should send expired. There's a lot of like, you know, extra stuff that is there in many hospitals. There are a lot of organizations that can that have cap capability to pay money and buy uh, decent stuff. Um, so I think we should work on that before we send expired stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, envisioning a future for this would be thinking about how the Palestinian healthcare system and how can form and create and, and produce its own supplies in order to be self-sustaining and not reliant upon aid, um, which is, you know, conditional. It is not immediate. And oftentimes, whatever aid packages are sent to Palestinians, they are not accessible in full. They're accessible in parts, right? They only get a part of it. It's rationed out, um, so again, when it, I, again, yeah, and echoing uh, what Dr. Said had said, you know, expired supplies are are you know definitely not not what people need, and and people have the capability and wealth to give these people what they deserve, and we should work towards doing that. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, I think some of the previous speakers have spoken about the notion of a collapsed healthcare system, mm. and I guess I'm not well versed enough to know what a revived healthcare system is in that same line of thinking of like what is the end goal here? Because obviously I agree with you know ending the occupation and getting a ceasefire, but in terms of a fully revived healthcare system, because the healthcare system was completely inadequate before, and so when we think about a future for that. 
what does that look like? Yeah, Dr. Hawash. Yeah, if I, I mean, the reason why the healthcare system was at 40% capacity is not because there are re no resources in Gaza or there are no um, uh, ta talented uh, healthcare workers. It's because the, uh, of the siege that has lasted 17 years. And this was a severe siege. Even before that, uh, before the 17 years, uh, the 17 year siege, Gaza was always um, economically um, made to be uh, more complex and less um, less um, vital than the rest of the West Bank. Uh, the Palest the way uh, the occupation uh, deals with Palestinian is that uh, there are several tiers of um, of Palestinians. So if you are uh, from the West Bank, you are different from uh, Gaza. So if you're from Gaza, your uh, freedom of movement is extremely restricted to the degree that you can never dream of leaving, leaving Gaza. If you are in the West Bank, you can probably go from one city to the other, but there are the checkpoints and the permits and the security clearance. So there is a good chance that you might not leave it, but you have a better chance than Gaza. Mm. If you are a refugee, if you, if you are in a refugee camp, you have a completely different status than the Gaza people and the West Bank people. And then somebody who's outside of Palestine, who's Palestinian, cannot come back to Palestine. And then the the final uh, category is the Palestinians who are Israeli citizens who have the Israeli citizenship that gives them some um, uh, be uh, benefits that are much, much better than me or Os uh, Osaid, but they are still um, a second-class citizen in their own mm. uh, in, uh, the country of citizenship. And this is a way to make it very difficult to uni unite the Palestinian together because somebody's interests might be different from the other person's interest, mm. and that's that's a very insidious and difficult situation. Definitely, definitely. Echoing that sort of fragmentation is uh, yeah. rev a revived system is not fragmented and also moving beyond just a simple healthcare space. I mean, a revive. I really like the term you used, actually. A revived healthcare system also requires the infrastructure for people to sustainably support themselves, as I said before. For instance, ending the occupation is crucial to that. Let's just talk about water, for instance. The permit to build a well is not granted to over 90% of uh, people in agriculture and people that are trying to create a sustainable water supply for their communities. And many of these communities in the West Bank are all fragmented. So they're all little isolated bubbles that are you know, uh, completely surrounded by military or settlement. So they're all separated. So these little pockets aren't even allowed to build their own water supply. And those wells get filled with cement. And it's something as simple as just water, right? But ending the occupation and ending that so the siege and ending this complete and utter control of Palestinian life is essential to any sort of revived healthcare system. Because even if we unify, if the settler colonial project remains... Um, there's no, there's a ceiling. There's nowhere to grow, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, any other questions, or does anyone else from the the panel want to speak on that that question? Oh, there's a. Um, I don't have a question. I just want to say thank you so much for doing this. I know you're a resident. Uh, Yazan, and despite everything that has happened since October 7th, the grief you must be feeling, but also having to come together and put this, and, and all the speakers too. So I just want to give you a round of applause, please. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you to uh, everyone, the panelists that joined us, and thank you for everyone here that has joined us, and thank you for everyone that has expressed solidarity with my people, with our people. Uh, may we all see freedom in our lifetime, inshallah. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Rally you. tomorrow. You see that? There's a rally and vigil at City Hall tomorrow in New York. Uh, everyone on the panels are getting plane tickets and coming. They don't know yet, but I'm uh, joking. Um, but yeah, if it's it's a healthcare worker rally and vigil, but uh, it's not just healthcare workers. Someone's raising their hands. Yeah, sure. 
fun. Yeah, of course, come. Bring everyone. Bring your families. Bring your mo- your friends. Whoever. But if you are a healthcare worker, I think it would be nice to show sort of collective power, right? Maybe wear your scrubs or wear a white coat. I don't like wearing my white coat, but we'll see. Um, and if you are wearing any logos, cover the logos with duct tape, um, just to be safe. And yeah, we hope that you join our efforts and uh, join this organization as it expands and grows. Um, this is the CAPTCHA to like join the, the group. Um, and you know, one more thing I wanted to say about this, and then uh, Suheb and, and Osaid can join and leave any final comments, but you know, something I envision for this, you know, the Palestinian cause is, um, it's paradigmatic and, it's, and it kind of contains all the elements of uh, colonialism and structural oppression and violence that our uh, black communities here face, indigenous communities face, um, communities um, across, you know, former colonized lands, uh, those that are forcibly displaced all across the world. Um, women that are, you know, at subject of violence in, in many countries that don't provide them pr- protection. Um, and I hope that our collective power and our solidarity for Palestine becomes a vehicle for liberation for everyone else because that's ultimately the goal. Um, so we are unified in this cause and every cause. All right. Um, and thank you again for coming. Anyone further questions? Just last minute things. We true free Palestine. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Soheb. Bye. Bye.